Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Today's session is going to be quite short. Um, I have spoken on several occasions about the diameter of my beam um, in this machine and uh, I've demonstrated that it is bigger than we think. But I've never gone to the trouble of showing you how you can test and check the size of your beam. So today I'm going to show you the method that I use. The beam is claimed to be five or six millimetres diameter for my 70 watt tube and the same would apply for probably uh, maybe an 80 and 100 watt tube as well. If you've got a 40 watt tube you may well think you've got a three millimetre diameter beam for example. Um, you may be surprised when you carry out this same test on your machine. Now here's how I'm going to go about checking um, my beam size. Now I've got a 70 watt laser. Um, which claims to have a six millimeter, five to six millimeter beam. Um, I'm using 20% power, which is, well, it's actually 44 watts. We're losing about 10% power through the mirrors, say. Let's just assume it's as bad as that for two mirrors. So I'm down to about 40 watts here. So let's do a pulse. Right, now purposely, I've burnt a hole in there and what I'm going to do is continue to burn a hole in there. I'm just going to pulse it and I'm going to blow the little sparkly bits away. Pulse. I don't want it to catch fire. But as time goes on what I'm doing I'm holding the pulse button on longer and longer to get the glow. Now it's no longer glowing. I'm now going to put the power right up to the maximum that I can run on this machine, which is 70%, which will be around about uh, probably 65 watts, 64, 65 watts, something like that here. And we'll do gentle pulses again. And you can see now that I've put the power up, it's starting to get bigger. I'm holding the pulse button on now for long periods, probably five, six seconds. And there we go. That's about as big as it gets. I can't burn it any bigger. What you're seeing in the background as smoke is actually coming off of my water bath in here, which I'm firing the laser into. Now the exit window on the laser tube is actually 12.7 or half inch diameter. And this hole here is around about 12.7. So everything that comes out of the tube is arriving at mirror three. And the other thing that I've had to do on this machine um, is to open out the bore of my lens tube or my my extension tube because it was very small and I've opened it out now to 13.5 well it means I've got to be pretty accurate to make sure that my 12.7 beam goes down the middle of a 13.5 diameter hole and so basically if you are losing power anywhere when you upgrade your machine this is the one place that you should start looking to start with that the, that's the shape that the laser beam will see as it approaches this head here. And so the question is, how accurate have I got to be to make sure that my beam doesn't hit the edge of the mirror? The target that I've got to aim at is 15 millimeters. So I've got to basically be within plus or minus a millimeter of the correct center position here. Otherwise I should start clipping the mirror. And this is definitely one of the key items. You must make the bore, make sure that the bore down there is big enough to take the diameter of your laser beam. Okay, now we've talked about beam diameter now, but there is another important factor to beam diameter, 
and that is the distribution of the power across the beam itself. Okay, now what I have here is a piece of 10 millimeter thick acrylic and what I'm going to attempt to do is to develop the profile of the power that's in that laser beam and hopefully we should be able to see exactly what that profile looks like. So I'm going to pulse this now, hold the pulse button on and I've got an airflow here otherwise it will catch fire and I'm blowing the fumes away and there we go that should be good enough that's about what four or five seconds okay now, now what I'm going to do I'm going to manually cut this little profile out and I'm going to do that by holding the pulse button and the arrow button at the same time okay now before I show you the actual result what I'm going to do is just to describe to you what you're going to see. Now why did I use acrylic for this particular test? One of the great properties that acrylic has, it doesn't really melt. You fire heat at acrylic and it evaporates and turns immediately into fumes, gas. So basically that process is called sublimation where there is no liquid phase. Now the amount of erosion which is basically evaporation of material is directly dependent upon the temperature or energy density in the laser beam itself and I'm using those two words interchangeably energy density and temperature because I know that at the center of this beam the temperature is round about 1500 degrees C um, I've tried to measure it with a thermocouple and I burnt the end off the thermocouple at 1300 degrees C and at this outside edge here where we stop getting erosion we stop getting erosion at around about six millimeter diameter and this is what the temperature profile or the energy profile looks like it starts dropping off rapidly as we get further away from the center of the beam but there is still energy here out at 10 millimeters enough to cause damage to the surface of the acrylic it isn't eroding it away it's sort of pimpling the surface and you'll find that if you look carefully you'll see some some little marks around here, little, t little marks of where we get little teeny weeny spikes of damage which are occurring down at this base here. But basically we can't detect damage on the surface of the acrylic beyond 10 millimeters. But that's only because that's the damage threshold for acrylic. And although this diagram gives you a pretty good idea of what the temperature is inside the beam, it doesn't tell you exactly how far the beam stretches out to. You have to use a more delicate material, which is why I used masking tape, to try and establish what the real boundary of the beam is. This is the damage threshold of the beam in acrylic, but it's good enough to demonstrate this Gaussian energy distribution across the beam. Now, first of all, we'll look down on it slightly so that you can see the damage area around the outside of the beam that I was talking about and you can see those blue marks on there those blue marks are because I had a blue plastic um, protective film on the surface and that blue plastic film has melted and gone into the damaged area and there I think you can probably just about make out the Gaussian profile the top of the beam is disappearing into the edge damage that I caused when I cut the thing out so here we are we've got one more view of it looking slightly up into the material so that you can see the crest of the profile. Now I've often been asked the question what happens to the laser when it comes out of the tube at the back of the machine over there? Now it runs round the machine and finishes up at this bottom right hand corner of the machine which depending on the size of your machine could be a distance of maybe three or four meters. Um, does the laser beam change its size as it travels around the machine? Well the answer to that question is no, certainly not for the distances that we are talking about. They do use very high power CO2 laser beams for uh, gunnery um, range finding and we're talking about maybe 20 or 25 kilometers where the laser beam has to fire over that distance, touch the object and then travel back to the source where it was emitted from and what they do they calculate knowing the speed of light 
how long that laser beam has taken to travel to and from the target. And then they can get very accurate, probably within a centimetre or so, accurate positioning for the target. So you can't have any major divergence of this beam over 20 or 25 kilometres, otherwise it just wouldn't do the job that it's supposed to do. So the whole point of a laser beam, it is a coherent beam and within this machine or any machine that we're using the beam will not diverge. The only reason that the beam will arrive bigger at this corner than it started off is because the mirrors have distorted the beam. So as you get a reflection off a slightly curved mirror it will either shrink or grow depending on which way the curvature of the mirror goes. So that's why we're basically looking for extremely flat mirrors in these machines so that we get no variation in the laser beam between its source and its final destination. Well thank you very much for your attention as usual. Um, I do hope that I've been clear and precise enough in my explanations that you understand exactly how your beam functions now. Um, one final thing that I must add. I've been asked if I can inform you guys that are hooked in to the RD Works lab forum. They've changed the software for running the website and now it is possible that when you log on first time you might not be able to get into the website. You do need to make some changes to your browser and the instructions that are now on the screen will help you to sort your browser out and gain access to your account. Please do not make comments on this message and do not write to me about it. I'm only the messenger. Thanks again for your time and I'll see you in the next session.